All right, we're back for another show and got a great guest. He's got some great experience in minor league baseball and building organizations. So I want to welcome Tony Enzer with me. How's it going, Tony? Andrew, it's going great. How are you doing this beautiful uh, Monday? Well, from the looks of it, I'm doing better because I'm not in a hoodie. Uh, there's no ice outside. Um, if there was ice where I live in Central Florida, we all should be scared. Yes, and the fruit prices would be going through the roof at the, in about a week or so. But yeah, we had a very uncorrect characteristic uh, snowstorm over the last couple, an ice storm over the last couple of days. So our field is completely covered in ice and snow and and uh, the roads are pretty slick out there today, but happy to be here joining with you. And the fact that you're in Florida, you know, maybe you're spreading some of that warmth up here because I think the high today is 20 degrees here in Amarillo. Ooh, wow. There's a reason why I moved to Florida and that's, that's one of them. <laughs> Even though I grew up up North, it's like, I just, my body is uh man, it's tough. tough. The older you get, the thinner your blood. Trust me. I feel it all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, that's cool. Well, I appreciate you joining me. I was kind of excited that uh, when I reached out, you were you were cool to join just because, you know, I've been following, you know, the launch of the team in Amarillo and, uh, you know, you know, some of the other organizations that you've been with over the years. So and, you know, I'm I'm fascinated with the sports world and got my first taste of baseball this year. So uh, it's been pretty fun. So, Tony, walk us through you know, kind of a little bit of your background, where, where are you from? And then, you know, kind of your stops along the way. Oh, wow. How, how long is this podcast? <laughs> we could go 24 hours if you want. <laughs> You're covering a lot of history, but I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I actually started, I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'm a Tennessee boy uh, as, as nature. Uh, that's where I began uh, my baseball career. I was born in Kentucky, but moved to Tennessee shortly after. So I'm a Tennessee guy. Um, but I, I grew up, went to high school there, college there, graduated from uh, University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, uh, got on with the Chattanooga Lookouts in the uh, mid to about 87, 86, 87 uh, time period, just as a, a college student looking for something to do. Uh, I came on in baseball. My first job in baseball was as a groundskeeper. I was the uh, third man on the grounds crew. Um, and then after about, after well, after some interesting, baseball was a lot different back then. I'm, I, when you when you're you see the word uh, or the movie Field of Dreams, and uh, not Field of Dreams, but Bull Durham, uh, <laughs> that's that's very true. Uh, a lot of things are very true in that movie of how baseball used to be. But uh, I was with the Chattanooga Lookouts for five years, groundskeeper, uh, stadium operations. Then I moved from uh, Chattanooga to Birmingham and I was, that was in 1990 was my move to Birmingham as the director of stadium operations. Interesting pathway, but my ballpark in Birmingham and uh, Chattanooga was built in 1935. Uh, so you're oh, talking wow. about a very old, beautiful, historic Ingalls Stadium. And then I moved to a ballpark that was built in 1988. Uh, I moved there two years after it was built in, uh, in 1990 and got to experience the old to the new um, and then uh, I was with the uh, Birmingham Barons for about, fi about 15 years. Um, I came on as director of stadium operations, eventually got uh, into uh, sales. That was one of my first things. I happened to be pretty good at sales. So I elevated from, from a director of stadium operations to uh, director of group sales, corporate sales, um, just on and on, VP of sales, all the way up to uh, finally the last eight years, uh, seven, eight years, I was the president general manager of the team uh, in Birmingham for about uh, seven, the last seven, eight of my 15 years there. We might remember one of my more famous players that we had a lot of great players actually that came through Birmingham, uh, but Michael Jordan year 1994 uh, was an incredible uh, year, incredible stop on my, on the, on the path of my career. Uh, we can talk more about that, but then in, in 2004, uh, Dave Elmore had bought the team from uh, Suntory International, which was a Japanese-owned uh, team when Michael Jordan was there. Um, so I had uh, ownership group in Art Clarkson uh, when I got there to uh, Suntory International to Dave Elmore, but went uh, bought the team in 1995, 
and I was with uh, Dave until 2004 when Dave asked me to go up to Colorado Springs. We had a struggling AAA club uh, in Colorado Springs, uh, AAA of the Rockies. He asked me to go there and, and uh, kind of uh, uh, rebuild that team. Uh, and I was in Colorado Springs for about 13 years. And in 2018, he really 17, uh, he and DG Elmore asked me to come to Amarillo to uh, open up this franchise, to build a stadium here because baseball had not been in Amarillo for 37 years. Uh, there was no professional affiliated team. There were some independent teams, I think, along the pathway. But um, he asked me to come build this organization, build this ballpark, and launch this team in Amarillo. And that's where I am now. So, yeah, a lot of years uh, covered in that. But uh, um, And there's not too many stories in there at all of those. I'm sure. I'm sure there's nothing, nothing to talk about. With nothing him. at all. Well, what made you want to get in the, the sports business to begin with? How'd that even come about? Was that something you knew in college or? Well, I, I, I like to say, I mean, um, my mother was a huge sports fan. She was a big baseball fan, uh, Jane Enzer, and, and she put me into sports. She, she loved sports. She put me into it. Uh, she liked to say that I was born with a glove in my hand. Um, and, you know, as I think about it, uh, it's, it's, uh, I thought about this earlier this year. It's kind of kind of strange. I've literally been in baseball since I was five years old. Wow. Either playing or working in it. I don't think there's ever been a year where I haven't been in baseball as a, as a young player, little leaguer, to high school, to college, uh, to then leaving college, going to work. Because uh, I went to work in baseball as as a, as a groundskeeper shortly after, after high school. So I have literally been in baseball since I was five. Um, so that's really long career uh, longevity. <laughs> that, that definitely is. So but, like, how'd you figure out like what area in sports you wanted to get into? You started out on, on, on the grounds crew. Um, did, was it just an opportunity that said, Hey, you got to start selling as well or, you know, I, I'd like to say I had this real clear vision of a path, a career path for myself, but I didn't. You know, I was like every young guy when I was coming out of college, and I was just looking for a summertime gig, some somewhere to, to you know, make a little bit of money uh, on my while I'm trying to support myself going to school. And I, I just happened to stumble upon this. A friend of mine, uh, his dad was the uh, general manager, and they needed help on the ground screw. And I was a big, strong kid. And, uh, and, and I had worked on baseball fields in my life as a, as a player and, and in college, you know, you're, you are the grounds crew in college. <laughs> so I had a little experience. And when I came out there that first day and, and they, you know, they, they put me on the field and you're getting the, the pregame prep ready, you know, to, to open up the gates and, and let the people in. And so you're prepping the field and they open the gates and all of a sudden I smell the hot dogs and the popcorn uh, cooking and all of a sudden there's people coming in the lights turn on and uh, I was hooked immediately you know from that standpoint uh, but again I just kept working my way I wanted as a young guy I just wanted more knowledge more knowledge more knowledge so I just kind of I, I kind of sucked in all the information I could from all the different aspects of what people were doing around the ballpark certainly when you're on the grounds crew you know when you start um, uh, you, you, you learn everything you need to out there. And then, of course, uh, they gave me uh, another title. And this is where my dual titles began. But again, I only get one paycheck. So I'm not sure how that's ever worked out for me. But I was a groundskeeper and director of stadium operations. So you're in, in stadium operations. You're in touch with everything. So you literally have your hand in every aspect. And, and this was a different time in baseball where – you know, uh, the most, uh, this was a double A team for Chattanooga, Tennessee. The most people you'd have on staff, full time staff, was maybe five or six. You know, there's not a double A team out there right now that doesn't have 20 people on staff. Right. The same thing that we did when, you know, when, when we were just getting started. So it was a different era. So you literally had to have your hand in everything. But, you know, I, I just love the aspect. I, I wanted to learn. I didn't, I wasn't really concerned about money. I didn't think that far ahead. I just really wanted to learn about all the different roles. And next thing you know, as I told you in Birmingham, I went through really three ownerships uh, during that period. And, and I was very proud of the fact that each time the ownership wanted to, to keep me because I was a valuable, valuable asset to the organization just because of that hunger for knowledge and, and wanting to learn more and take on more roles. And 
and I was always a, a, a company man. I, I loved working in baseball. I loved working for the companies. I, I had some great mentors along the way, some great general managers that, uh, that trained me on, on, on how they did things. And so I took on their personas and all their expertise in the game. And, you know, and that's just, uh, I, I never saw it. Like I say, I didn't have a plan. I'm not going to go from A to B to C to D. Right. I didn't have it. it just occurred because of a, I, I think a strong work ethic and a, and a hunger and a desire for, for more knowledge. Yeah. I think, you know, work ethic is, is huge. And I, I just think that a lot of the uh, it's a lot different now with, with, with a lot of people. I mean, back, back then, back when we were getting started, I think it was a different mentality. These internships weren't paid back then, at <laughs> least uh, the ones I know. About. <laughs> and uh, you know, now everybody's, you know, so it's hard to find that, um, that work ethic out there. It's still out there, but it's definitely harder to find, I think. So. Yeah, no, I, 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 you're right. I mean, the culture has changed, society has changed, but there, I've, I've seen some really strong kids that, that are coming up in our industry. Uh, people that are like that, they're hungry. I mean, it was a different time. I, I don't think a lot of people would accept some of the things. You know, I, I think at one point I was making uh, two, uh, I think it was around two twenty-five an hour, right? So that yeah. was that was minimum wage back then. Right. It's like horse and buggy days. Yeah. You know, um, but I, I was literally making 220, but I didn't care. It wasn't about the money for me. It was about the, it was about the job. It was about the experience. And yeah, it was a different time, but there are, there are a lot of uh, young kids today that, that have a great work ethic and that really yeah. have a real sense of what they're doing. Very intelligent. I mean, it's a different game with the technology that we have with oh, our yeah. systems and digital, everything's digital uh, with our ticketing systems. Now, I mean, the technology it's a different kind of work ethic. It's a different type of employee, uh, probably a lot more knowledgeable than, than we were when I was coming up in the game. Oh, so, yeah. uh, very, so much more at their, t the, their fingertips now. I mean, and just with, like you said, all the technology, I mean, think of how much that saves now as far as time and that learning curve. And when back then there was no email, <laughs> you <right>. know, <laughs> it was fax. Let's fax out some stuff. Although, trust me, I, I was around when all this stuff was beginning, and it supposedly it was going to save us from all the work and give us more leisure time. Nah. I'm not sure that that's happened. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, I, it, the, the kids today, are they're just so knowledgeable, and, these, and they're, they're growing up, and it's second nature to them, and I love that, the creativity that they have. Um, we work on the work ethic side of things, the, 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 just the, the – the intelligence they have towards those things and how to create experience. Cause to me, that's what really matters. It's about how you create an experience for your fans yep. and with the video systems, the ticketing systems, everything that goes in lies to making that experience easier for our fans. That's what I want. And that's what we together as a staff here at the sod poodles, we all pull the wagon in the same direction because you have to make it easier and more comfortable for your fans to, to spend their money with you. I mean, that's really what it's all about. If you make it comfortable and you respect the fans and you give them the things that they want, then they'll spend their hard earned dollars with you. And uh, to me, that's what really matters. And, and our, our, our kids are fantastic at it. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, I've, I've seen you, you guys are just killing it down there, but let's go back to um, your, your Birmingham uh, days. So how did life change once Michael Jordan ended up getting signed? And did you have enough notice to even prepare for that? Well, that, that was uh, 1994. Michael Jordan was, you know, signed by Jerry Reinsdorf of the Chicago White Sox uh, to play, well, minor league baseball. Jerry Reinsdorf was the owner of the, the Chicago Bulls and the Chicago White Sox. Still right. is. Um, but, uh, you know, he signed it and Michael was going to play minor league baseball. So it was going to come down to Birmingham or Nashville. And the funny thing is that, the people in Nashville, the owners in Nashville were saying, Michael's coming, Michael's coming, Michael's coming. And they were selling a lot of season tickets and <laughs> a lot of stuff that way. And we were, uh, we had, we had a great uh, general manager and, and our president at the time was Bill Hardikoff. And so Bill's a very sharp guy. And so he's like, no, we don't know. And that's what he told us. We don't know if Michael's coming. So, but if you'd like to get a seat on the chance that he might be here, if you want season tickets, whatever sponsorship, uh, then it you know could be a wise move for you, but we just don't know for certain whether he's coming. And about a week before 
maybe 10 days before the season broke, uh, Michael left camp and they, to that day, I mean, I remember it was like a, it was like waiting on Christmas, you know, to get there is that they decided that Michael was going to, to uh, Birmingham instead of Nashville. And we had about a week's notice, probably to 10 days to get him here. We'd been thinking about it the whole time. Right. And you know, we don't, in my league baseball, you, you're all, you're already overwhelmed with everything you're doing. So adding more onto it was, you know, <laughs> You couldn't do more to prepare for it, except for all of a sudden. Then, once it happened, things started blowing up. The, you know, the tickets started to flow in. The, the operational side of things, when the, when the season finally did get there, it was incredible. We went from drawing 267,000 people in uh, 1993 to 467,000 people in 1994. So, wow. you know, Big deal. Yeah, you're, you're, you're talking about a massive difference of people. And you know, you've been in baseball that you know, it, it, the more people, the more intense, the more, the more hard, the, the harder the work is. Yep. Um, so it just compounded everything that we were doing. Uh, not only just the sheer number of people, because um, Michael was, uh, he was, he was a fantastic person. First off, I still give, uh, people don't give Michael the credit he deserves for what he did and putting minor league baseball on the map. I mean, certainly you have to remember around that time you had Bull Durham, the movie, right. and that was about it. Um, the marketing people didn't start getting into minor league baseball until after Bull Durham, that period when Michael was there in the 90s, just in the 1990s, that 10 year period, there were set, I believe 72 new ballparks built in minor league baseball. Wow. And 160 teams. So almost half of them got new stadiums in that 10 year period of the nineties. And, and Michael was a big part of that, but more marketing people, business people got into the game, but uh, having Michael there was an incredible experience, incredible uh, uh, journey for all of us that were a part of it. Um, he did so many things and we learned so many things in that year. I tell people all the time, I, I learned more in that year than the previous five of the post five. I mean, it was, you experienced everything that we had literally the, the, the eyes of the world, uh, the, the lens of the world was on Birmingham, Alabama in 1994. So many celebrities. We, uh, I can't tell you how many, I think we had uh, on the first day of, you know, a press box normally has about six or seven media people in it, you know, for, yeah. for uh, a game. On our opening day, we had 250 media credentials issued. We had to turn normal hospitality areas into auxiliary press areas. Um, we had 35 different countries represented uh, from people that came to uh, to do stories, news stories on, on Michael Jordan. Every day I had to create a different way for him to get out of the ballpark, you know, from, from fans and everything else. It was a lot of, a lot of cloak and dagger stuff. So I would send his car out this way and then take him out a different way. I mean, it was incredible, incredible things going on there how much of an impact did that make just on all the revenue streams? I mean, did, did you guys see like a big jump in, in merch sales and like people buying merch all over the world? Um, or um, was it just more on a local level in the ballpark? No, no, no. I mean, it, you know, having Michael literally when the eyes of the world are on your stadium, on your franchise, on everything blew up, whether it be game day revenue concession revenue, uh, merchandise sales all over the world. I, I remember going to uh, um, the double-A all-star game that year was up in, up in the East, East, East coast league. Um, I can't remember the name of the city. Gosh, darn it. It'll come to me, but it was on the East coast. And I remember Bill and I, our, our GM uh, at the time, Bill Hardikoff and I were driving through uh, New York. We're heading to, uh, uh, to uh, Cooperstown. I mean, to take a look out there. And we stopped at a convenience store. And I, I just remember having my Birmingham Barons logo on, you know, and this is a place I've never been. I've never been to New York or that area. And, and, and I had my logo on my staff shirt and it goes, oh, Birmingham Barons, you guys are where Michael's playing. And so you could tell, I mean, it was just, uh, it was no one, I couldn't imagine someone in upstate New York knowing about the Birmingham Barons. And this was a time before internet, not before internet, but before, Right. Uh, media and all the, the ease of knowledge that we have today, but it was a different time. And, and so 
you, there was a sense Birmingham was literally on everyone's news channel virtually every night with Michael Jordan playing baseball. Yeah. No, I mean, I definitely, I, I remember, you know, watching it. So, I mean, it definitely, I mean, some of the games, I, I don't know if they were broadcast, but there was a lot of video out there from, from that, but how did you, so, you know, obviously you know how that goes, but then, so how do you deal with the following year when he's not there? Like how, I mean, that has to be like kind of um, difficult because obviously he was a big, a big push. Um, so how do you kind of keep, keep things positive going through that? Well, I, I think we all needed the rest first off. Go to Nashville, go to Nashville. Yeah. To, to, for, to have a normal year in the year. Remember 1995 also was the year of the strike. So there was something going on at that point as well, you know, but, but having, having Michael Jordan, being a part of his journey, being part of his life and getting to know the guy for six months, that was a blessing. I mean, a blessing on everyone that worked there has gone on to have a lot of success and whatever it is they chose to do just because of the experience that you have and what you gained. And if you, if you had a great attitude going into it, you took that for what it was. It was just a, a great experience to, to, to set the world, to do something different, to suit, to change the world of baseball as we knew it, that w world did change from that year. Yeah. I mean, we said Michael Jordan drew 467. We averaged 7,000 people a game, you know, in, which is almost, uh, I think we were averaging 4,000 a game uh, before that. So you can imagine 3,000 more people. And instead of, you know, some people not showing up with their tickets, all the tickets were used. Right, so the yeah. park was through the roof, but that was at home. And, but you have to remember on the road, it was a, he sold over a million tickets on the road. Because and, and with, with, with Birmingham, it was 70 dates, but people knew, well, they felt they knew, that he was going to be there for a while so they could come see him on different days of the week. When you go to Jacksonville or you go to Greenville at the time or Chattanooga, those people are thinking he may not ever come back. So every game he went to on the road, literally every game was sold out. So you can see the impact he made on the game, not just financially for, for Birmingham, but, uh, and the exposure. I mean, you can't have that much exposure, but you know, that was truly a blessing, but you know, the next year was just another year. I mean, you, you set the bar high. So in Birmingham, the bar was really high at that point. Um, but we kept the bar high. We kept the bar, bar high for years to come. Just in the experiences and the things that we learned, we learned to translate that to our, our, our fans when you don't have Michael Jordan. When you yeah. have Frank Thomas or we have Mark Burley or you have, uh, you know, all the different players, uh, Joe Creedy that came through Birmingham, all these great players. Uh, so you, you, you still learn. For me, it's always been about the fans. So all the things I learned and transitioned and the different promotions and, and ways to take care of fans we learned in the Michael Jordan uh, year just translates into taking care of fans uh, for the next 10, 15, 20 years. In, in your career, have you seen anyone else kind of get anything close to that as far as like – uh, making an impact and you know when when a player when they're on the road or when they're at home like really moved the needle like that no uh, there, there's been no one I mean there's yeah. been no one since Michael Jordan that has done what Michael Jordan has done now Tim Tebow uh, you know he's a great person himself he, he's had a, a really nice impact on the lower levels where where he's played um, but and and but not to that intensity I mean you you can't imagine the intensity of the whole world watching uh, this one guy. He's I mean, he got to be the most famous, famous athlete champion. at that time, too, like he in the world. The I mean, athlete in the world. Yeah. At the time, and the most what recognized athlete in the world. I think he'd already had three, three or four world championships that you know he carried, yeah. you know, in in the NBA, and then I think he got two or three more after. Uh, he left Birmingham and went back to the NBA and won a, at least two more world championships. So um, no, it, 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 there's no one has touched what he's done in the game. Literally no one. Yeah. That's why I say, I wish people gave him more credit. Cause you know, a lot of the critics like to say, okay, he's the greatest athlete in the world, but he got humbled by baseball. Well, baseball is the hardest sport in the world to hit. You know, in golf, you're the ball sitting on a tee, you right. know, 
in basketball, it's a big ball and it's, you know, basket and everything, but in football is, but in baseball, you're trying to hit a five inch round object with another five inch round object that's traveling anywhere from, uh, from 78 to 104 miles an hour doing all kinds of things. It's the hardest sport in the world. It's humbled everybody. Yeah. Well, and most, even the greats, it's not like they just went right to the major leagues and dominated. I mean, that, that's, that's very, you know, rare. I mean, people, it takes years to build up and. And Michael uh, hadn't played since he was 14. Uh, had yeah. played organized baseball since he was 14. So what he was able to achieve was incredible. Huge. Uh, yeah. uh, and that just shows you what an athlete he was because he was so yeah. incredible. He's a, uh, a lot of people hit him because he batted just uh, just over 200, but he had uh, had several home runs. He led the team in stolen bases. He became a great baseball. He play, became a good baseball player. Had he continued on, had it not been for the strike in 95, he would have continued playing baseball, and who knows what he could have achieved because he was extremely gifted. Yeah, and dedicated it looked like. so. Oh, hardest guy, I'm telling you. The, the first guy to come to the ballpark every day and the last guy to leave. There's nobody that worked harder at being, at being great at baseball than Michael Jordan did. He, he, he was literally uh, uh, one of the hardest working guys I've ever seen. Let's kind of switch gears. Like, you know, minor league baseball to me is, you know, a lot of it is promotions and marketing and, and, uh, you know, fan experience, like you had mentioned. So what are some of the cool or um, interesting promotions that you've been a part of over the years that like really stand out? Wow. Uh, well, I, I've been part of some great ones, you know, the Beanie Baby craze, if you remember that, remember when Beanie Babies, I, I remember driving down the road, having, you know, uh, 2000 Beanie Babies in my car, or that I was dirty. robbed. <laughs> <laughs> because it was so crazy at the time. There were there were some of those Beanie Babies worth thousands of dollars. Um, but Beanie Babies, uh, I was in that craze. Uh, you might remember Plunger Night with Roto-Rooter that we did in Birmingham. Uh, I've had Ma Max Patkin at the ballpark, uh, Myron Noodleman at the ballpark. Uh, I had the, the, the famous chicken so many different times. I mean, uh, so, some of these guys uh, are I, I, I'm friends with, you know, the the San Diego chicken. He's a great, great person. You know, he's getting a little up there nowadays, but even last year when I opened up uh, Hodgetown, I asked Ted to come back and do a performance here in, in Amarillo. And it was like, uh, it was like one of the, one of the neatest moments in baseball that I've had. Cause you know, he's been performing for 30 years and, wow. and, and, and he came in and went, Back in the day, he was very popular here in Birmingham. Again, baseball hasn't affiliated professional baseball hasn't been in in, uh, uh, in um, Amarillo uh, since uh, for 37 years. So for the chicken to come back and do our inaugural season was extremely special. But yeah, we get I've done everything from from every every giveaway you can possibly imagine: hat night, bat night, glove night, all those. Uh, one of the, some of the more interesting ones were, um, were plunger night where we gave away, uh, I think it was 15 it. plungers to people with our Barron's logo on the plunger. That was real neat. Being part of the Rickwood Classic, helping to create that event uh, back in the 90s, if you're familiar with the Rickwood Classic. I, I put on 10 of them, 12 of them. Um, and, uh, and that was really special to go back to the oldest ballpark in the, in the world uh, on the historical register and turn back the clock and play uh, games there. In fact, you know, invented the, 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 just the event itself and, and working with our staff to create the, the promotions that would bring people back and celebrate what we want to celebrate uh, in, in that particular year. Um, one of my worst promotions I ever did, what I, I thought was going to be the best promotion, uh, was I thought bringing the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders to Birmingham was going to be phenomenal. I, and it cost a lot of money. This is back in the late nineties, I think early 2000. Um, I think I spent $25,000 bringing the, uh, and this is <laughs> late nineties, $25,000 bringing the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders to Birmingham. And I thought, you know, this is, these are performers. It, this is like big time. It's like bringing, you know, New York to, to Birmingham. This is, uh, it was like a rockette show. I, I thought it was going to be 
huge. And I was going to win all these accolades and everything else. But then I remembered that, you know, we we're uh, not only the, in the Bible Belt, but we we're also the buckle of the Bible Belt there in, in Birmingham. So the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders did not go over very well. I think we had 2,000 people there uh, when I was expecting, you know, 7,000 to 10,000 people. Not a great promotion. So you learn with your failures. Hey, you're going to have some. I mean, it's just a... Oh, trust me. I like to tell people, I like to tell my staff, look, I've already, I've already, I've already made more mistakes than you'll ever make in your career. <laughs> yeah. That's how I got here. It's, yeah. It's, you you, you got to take the risk. Twice. You know, yeah. You, you learn from your mistakes. As long as you're, you have the right attitude going forward and you're, you're doing things for the right reasons. You're always going to be successful in this game. This is the one, and I love that about sales. I love that about baseball and, and working for the Elmores. Um, you can be as successful as you want to be. There's no one holding you back here. Uh, I don't care uh, what your situation is, where you are, who you are. If you want to be successful in my organization, you just have to work. And you can be as successful as you want and you can leapfrog and you can go other places and, 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 and grow your career and be higher. But it, it, I love the fact that I get to determine every day whether I'm happy or not. Yeah. That's a pretty cool job to have in baseball. I, I, I literally don't let any outside and I don't know why anyone would let any outside uh, forces determine whether or not I'm happy that day. I'm happy because I put forth the effort and, and the desire and the drive to, to do something that day that made me happy. And, and so working in sports, working for the Elmores uh, has been a blessing my whole career and, and having young people around. I mean, I, I'm, I'm getting up there in age now. No. I'm, not, I'm not a young man anymore. I can't say I'm part of that crew, but um, that the ingenuity and the, and the passion that they have and the drive that they have, and they just keep me young. And I, I love that. I love working with these guys and, and gals that, that uh, are part of our soft pool team. And, they, they literally, I call them the originals because they created something from nothing. Yeah. We literally had nothing. We didn't have a business card in this town. We had no logo, no team name, no building, no ballpark, no employees. I was the only employee. Uh, so what we built from this has been extremely special. And of course, you and I talked, we drew 450,000 people in our first season in a 200,000 person market, which is, it's unheard of. Uh, that's why I really feel that Emerald pound for pound is the best baseball market in the country. No, I'll fight that out with anybody. <laughs> no fighting. Well, let's talk about that though, as far as the, the start of uh, Amarillo, because I love the startup phase of, of businesses, it's, you know, outside of sports, I, you know, I, I love to build businesses up and flip them. Um, I've started multiple sports teams from scratch. So, you know, how long, of a process was it for you guys? And at what point did you get involved with it? Uh, I, we, we really started talking seriously about it when I was, a, I was running the AAA club for the Colorado Rockies and, and the Elmore group uh, in Colorado Springs. So is it in, I think in June of 2017, we announced that the, the team was going to be leaving. Um, and so we, we became, became uh, deep in talks of whether I was going to, stay in Colorado Springs, where I was going to go to help him in San Antonio, or whether I was going to come here and do this. And I just saw this as an opportunity. I said, look, I, I've, I've, I've done, I've, I've, I've rebuilt clubs. I've started, I have never started from scratch. I've taken yeah. over successful clubs, made them more successful, taken over problem clubs and, 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 and made them successful, but I've never started anything on my own and kind of taken all the knowledge that I've had in my career and decided to start from scratch. That's the only time that you That's can cool. own, yeah. yeah, that you can do what you wanted to do and not have to rely on the history of what you've been doing and people complaining about changing history. Right. So uh, we got a real chance to start from scratch and to do all the things that we wanted to do in this sport, uh, in, in this game. And, and uh, so that was, I started coming down here probably, uh, early 2018 late 2017 just for site visits and things of that yeah. nature and then really got into it i moved here finally with my family in may of 2018 uh worked finished up the triple a season i was doing a lot of commuting probably a lot of a lot of day trips from colorado springs to amarillo uh in in uh in about 14 trips um 
but we just started transitioning here, put together an office here, started building a little bit of staff here. So I was doing both teams at one time, building this one, ending that one. And, uh, and it was really, really a, a neat experience. Did you um, have involvement with, you know, like the actual planning of the stadium as far as like amenities and just different things within, or were you kind of like, Hey, here's the blueprints. This is what we're doing. You're kind of stuck with it. No, no, no. It was the, the architects, we had Populous as our architect, which is Populous by far is in, in my mind, the best uh, architect uh, firm in the, in the country and, and building ballparks. Um, no one does it better than Populous. So uh, I was in every construction meeting. Our owners and myself were in the early development stage of, they didn't say, hey, here's a ballpark, go go fit your organization to the right. ballpark. They said, here's a shell of a ballpark. Now, what can we do to make this ballpark fit within what you want to do as an organization? And and I was in every construction meeting uh, for for better part of a year and a half. Um, and, and, and really helping to, when they, they were talking about certain things, I'm like, you know, I'm not sure from a baseball perspective that that's going to work. Uh, can we do it a different way? Or I'm not sure from a hospitality standpoint, that's where we want that bar. Can we move that over here? And they were like, yeah, that's what they wanted. That was our responsibility, quite honestly. That's what they wanted from us was to give them insight into the ballpark and how we can make it function for ourselves because it was our operation. Once this thing built, populace is gone, right. and the builders are gone. Western Hunt, uh, our, our, our builders in the ballpark, they're gone. So we'd be stuck with it. So any decision we made, we had to make very good, well thought out, thoughtful decisions on what we wanted from the ballpark, and fit within the budget, obviously. That that's always the tough one, the budget. But how did you? Is it was there anything that was like, uh, man, gotta have this, gotta have that. Um, was there anything that you really were strongly convicted about that you wanted the stadium to have? Yeah, I mean, everything from the color of the stadium. Uh, I mean, the, that was our, that was us doing that. That was, Populous did it, the, what you see as a color, which is the vinyl pads, which is the seating, uh, which is uh, the, the, the way you, basically the clothes that you put on your, on your ballpark uh, every single day. That's, that's kind of some of the things, but there were certain things with the uh, hospitality areas that we just had to have in a certain place. Uh, I, I consulted with the San Diego Padres, the San Diego Padres. Uh, I wanted them to be very comfortable in the clubhouse that we built. So we took, I took some of the ideas from Colorado Springs and talking with my trainer in the clubhouse there saying, if you had to build your own new clubhouse, what would you like to see? And a lot of it involved glass and windows, which was not in the original design. So we changed that to suit what that trainer thought was the best. Uh, he wanted to be able to see from the training room to the ice room, all the way through to the workout room. So he could keep track of the players and what they were doing. So that was very important to him. So we made those changes. The, uh, the Padres wanted to have all their coaches together in a locker room, not the manager, but the coaches and, and instructors, and yet have an office space so what was going to be a, a locker room uh, for a couple of coaches, and then we had the other coaches over on another side, became a communal locker room, but of a huge workspace for our coaching staff. And, and that's an input that the Padres wanted, and I thought that was great. So we really worked this, ball, this ballpark to, to, to fit a lot of needs. And certainly, uh, I, I remember there was a bar up in our club area that was offset and because we have a, a, a circular rotunda at the main entrance. Oh, the bar was circling a, a large column there. And I was like, well, that's gonna be cool. It's gonna be great looking, but you know, if you want a bar, you want your bar close to the field where everybody can see it. So we moved that bar over a full bar over in the construction changes. I remember where there was discussion on sliders uh, for our suite levels. Um, you can have either a, a storefront door or you can have sliding uh, accordion style door where the whole thing opens up. Well, we wanted those sliding accordion style doors. So we went to our, our, our suite owner and said, look, this is gonna cost a couple, several hundred thousand dollars. Would you like to have this? And they, they bought into it, they wanted it. Now you could never change that. You could never put a, uh, you could yeah. never show them something different because it's absolutely gorgeous. So those things we were, 
deep, deep into the construction of the ballpark to make it fit our operation from our ownership to myself, to my staff, you know, uh, we, we, we reached out and sought. That's one thing about my management style. I don't know everything by any stretch of the imagination, but I can find out. And so bring a lot of people in and, and getting their input uh, on things that I'm not familiar with. I think that's a key to, to being successful and getting more people involved. So uh, very fortunate to have great people that, that helped us to get involved, to, to build this ballpark. Yeah. I mean, it takes, it takes a lot of people and, and you hit it on the head. I mean, you need to, you know, surround yourself with, with some bright people. Oh, the absolutely. one thing I really liked about what I saw on your stadium was the clean look. So like, if you look in the outfield at the signage, you know, it's, it's nice and clean. It's monochromatic. Is that how you had it in Colorado or was that something new you wanted to do here? No, that's one of those things that I wanted to do um, that I did not, uh, never in my career had I had uh, a, a clean wall like that. And, and what, for your, for your listeners and your viewers, what I'm talking about is, is a solid color wall and then white monochromatic lettering for the logo on that padded wall. It's a very so clean, clean, very Man. classic, very professional look. The only time I can remember anything like it was when we did, uh, when I hosted the SEC baseball tournament in Birmingham back in the, well, I, I hosted that for 10 years as well in Birmingham. But um, so we had a little bit of that during the SEC and I saw those logos and teams on there and I've seen it in other places too, but having that clean look on the wall, I mean, it, it sets you up, set our partners apart. So not only does the, the ballpark look clean and you don't have 52 billboards out there with, with all different varieties of colors and, and everything else, you have a clean wall but it really it gives our our sponsors much greater visibility because you can you clearly see we're screaming the names of those twenty uh, yep. sponsors out there as opposed to you know maybe saying a little bit quieter when you, you have so many different colors and and size billboards and everything else. So I'm I was very pleased with that the white chromatic look. I would recommend that to anyone that's you know redoing an outfield wall um, to uh, and those are. On that's vinyl uh, padded walls, and then we have a, a, a 225 foot LED ribbon goes across that. So I was going to say that's another great thing because that adds color. Me as a salesperson, that's that's a lot of inventory that can become available, and then from a fan experience, you know, it just there's a lot more you can do with it. So it's yeah. kind of we kinda use that as both that, and I remember the discussion with DG Elmore. He he's he, I love DG Elmore. He's our owner. And uh, he sets the bar pretty high for us. I mean, I, I, I got to tell you. And I remember at a winter meetings, I'm, I'm sitting there going through and he, he's looking, we're setting the budget for Amarillo. And I came in with this budget number and he goes, oh, that's not enough. And I'm like, I don't have, I looked and I said, I don't have enough signage to reach. I don't have enough signage capabilities. And so that uh, digital ribbon wall and, you know, Nick Hall, who, you know, uh, he yeah. and I worked on it. Uh, a, a lot during the winter meetings because I had to come up with a way to, to sell about 400,000 more dollars in, in signage and I was like I don't have that capability in this current design so I need we need digital and yep. so that digital wall you know, we have a 1400 square foot large LED video beautiful scoreboard but the uh, the ribbon came late in the game and that's the way we added not only signage for opportunities for our sponsors but you're right it's great at a uh, way to share information with our, our fans, our, a way for us to promote ourselves for future games and opportunities. And uh, it's, it's been a, it's been a godsend to have that. It's really, really neat. Well, and you see, you know, I was up in uh, Fredericksburg with the nationals. And so Nick, who you mentioned was with you and then became the, the GM up, uh, up there. There's a lot of similarities on, on that. And again, my first time in baseball. So, um, you know, just sitting down with him and kind of explaining how it was in Amarillo and, and why he liked this. But I know the, the LED board was 100% from, you know, you guys and, and the same thing with the outfield walls. And it, it made it look so clean, um, especially on a brand new ballpark. It just, it elevates it. Um, and especially, you know, up there, I mean, that, that was going for some premium dollars and, um, you want to make sure that you're maximizing that 
that value for your partner and, you know, and you don't want it to look like a circus, you know, from a fan perspective. I mean, you know, I've, I've seen it where I was at the old ballpark in, in uh, Potomac because um, we had to go up there for some a couple of days and you, you just saw how the ads were. It was like they were almost like game day program ads and bullet points and so busy that it just, I, in my opinion, devalues it. And so um, when I saw your outfield wall and, and Nick was telling me about why we were doing it here, it's like, man, it just it's so refreshing um, cause I started doing something similar a few years ago, um, with soccer, you know, um, you know, we have dasher boards like hockey. So a lot of teams do that Potomac, you know, look the, the bullet points that nobody can even read it. Number one, cause it's so small. Uh, but then it just clutters it up. So we started kind of going more of the NHL route where NHL route is it's just the simple logo. And some of those are, are colored, but they're, they're not like, you know, uh, a colored background or, or anything too crazy. So really like what you did first class. So when you got there, you know, starting up from scratch, you were, you were employee number one, you know, like, how did you start building a team? Like, what were you really looking for when you started putting the pieces together? Well, meetings were shorter when it was just me. So (laughs) it was always that. Um, but no, I, I knew, and it wasn't just me. I had a staff that, that I was, I was the first employee, obviously. Um, but I had staff in Colorado Springs that was going to transition down there with me. Okay. So I was working with them for probably six months. Uh, we were still doing Colorado Springs, right. but in my office in Colorado Springs, I'd have meetings with my staff, the four or five people that I was bringing down to Amarillo in Colorado Springs. Right. Uh, so Uh, I had a great core nucleus of some people that were coming from, because Colorado Springs was going to go from AAA to uh, short season rookie. So you you don't need a lot of people. You don't need as many people for the, for short season rookie level as you do uh, at the AAA. So uh, I arranged the staff that I was going to bring here. We started working on it, you know, and the first thing that, that I felt was important was I needed people to know me and to know the type of person I am know the operation, know the Elmores. And so that's one thing we did. And, and I think we did a big focus on, on everything we did was respecting this community. Cause I think other people had come in in the past, they tried to pull things, you know, uh, you know, independent teams would come and go and all that sort of thing. They wanted, they wanted something special here and they wanted to be treated with the respect that they deserved to, to be treated with. And we gave them that. I, I told our staff, I said, look, we, everything that they want, we're going to deliver on at a professional level. We're not, we maybe can't give them everything that they may want, but we're going to give them the type of organization that they want. And so from, from the word go, uh, we've been about respecting our community, about respecting what they feel about themselves. We've done our focus groups. We've done all the different things we've learned about our community and, and what they felt of themselves. And I said, we're going to deliver that. That's what they want. We're going to deliver that. And the community has responded like you would not believe. As we say, uh, 450,000 people in a 200,000 person market. Uh, we've sold tickets in our inaugural season to every state in the country uh, except one. Wow. Which one? Got to guess. Alaska. Boom. <laughs> really? Yes. I thought maybe somebody That's would come down from Alaska. <laughs> If you know somebody in Alaska, we, we literally through our online ticketing system sold a ticket to every because uh, Amarillo is a place where you drive through a lot to get from place to place. Yeah. But now we hope that to be that destination where people are coming and stopping to see the sod poodles. Uh, we finished number two in the country in merchandise sales. Nice. Only behind Las Vegas. Okay. So imagine that. Uh, and how, how big is Vegas compared to Amarillo? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Three times larger market. Yeah. So uh, that just shows you the pride in, that this community has in this team. And, and, and it's all been done by the way we, from the word go, how we've treated with our, our community with respect and, and wanted them to be involved in the operation. What were some of the biggest obstacles that you had to overcome from you know, that start until that first game? Because I know there had to be a a handful of things that uh, probably didn't go as planned. (laughs) Oh, there there was, there were, there were were more than I could uh, possibly tell you. 
But I mean, obviously creating the brand Sod Poodles was not an easy task. I mean, that was not something that was very well received right out of the gate. In fact, I thought they were gonna run me out of town for the first, when I, once we announced that that was gonna be the team name or that these were the finalists uh, and then the team name, I thought they literally are going to run me out of town because they did not like it. It was. What's the history of the name? Like, what's tell me about it. How did it come about, and what does it mean? Well, a sod poodle is a black-tailed prairie dog. It's what the early pioneers called a prairie dog, and it was a sod poodle because it barked. Um, so these European travelers come in in the eighteen mid eighteen hundreds, and they see this animal sticking its head up out of the ground, and they called it a sod poodle. Um, at the time, there was one article on the entire internet de dedicated to sod poodle. Uh, now, I, I, I challenge you to go look up the word sod poodles and see how many pages are dedicated. Oh, yeah. Probably 25 pages, all with 25 uh, links on it. Um, but how we had created it, we, we did a contest. That we worked with Brandios, great partners, uh, the folks, uh, Jason and... and, uh, and uh, Oh gosh, well, Jason and I'll come to me in a minute. But the guys at Brandios were great to work with. So we did our focus group. We found out what our community wanted, what they were looking for, how they viewed themselves. And then we brought in, uh, we did a name the team contest. We got 3000 entries. We broke down all those entries into categories and Prairie Dog was one of those, uh, was one of those categories. Uh, but uh, I had said early on, we had a, criteria for me had to be original, had to be kid friendly, had to be marketable, had to be all these different things, right? So five or six different and it had to be original, unique. Um, <laughs> and so Prairie Dog was the most uh, entered name of all the categories, you know, everything from trucking to or travel trucking, which is where uh, long haulers came from, from the Western industry to the quarter horse industry to the to, uh, um, you know, uh, the beef industry. So all those things that had been, uh, all those names, we, we bunched them into categories to simplify things. And Prairie Dog was the number one, but I said, look, we can't be Prairie Dogs because Prairie Dogs had already been done. Abilene uh, years ago was a, a professional baseball team uh, and they, they were already the Abilene Prairie Dogs. So that didn't count. So I can, I remember the moment because we're sitting around a long conference table at the, at the hotel across the embassy suites here at uh, across the ballpark. And I, I told my staff, I said, look, I want to kind of focus on this, this prairie dog thing, because I couldn't believe after doing some research into it, that Disney hadn't done something with the prairie dog. It's the cutest animal. It's the most yeah. intelligent mammal, underground mammal in, in the world. It's, it's incredible. The, the structure, if you look into a prairie dog, they have eight, nine compartments underground that you can't see. They literally have a dining compartment. They have a nursery. They have a sleeping area. They have a waste wow. or waste room. It, they're, they're, they have a, a lounge area. They have a food pantry. So all these things underground that you, they, and they have the highest communication skills uh, of any uh, mammal. I mean, they, not, when you hear and you see a prairie dog or, or sod poodle stepping up and you see him barking at somebody, he can not only tell that not just that there's a there's an object coming here, danger. No, there's an object. Uh, he's he's wearing a red shirt. He has a beard. He's a man, and he's six foot some on top. They, that's how communicative they are. And as you can tell, I, we've been in touch with uh, professors, uh, and uh, and uh, we actually reached out to a expert in prairie dog, a professor of prairie dog studies, when we were coming up with the name just to verify what we were thinking. Um, so we're all around this table. And I said, I really want to focus on, on Prairie Dog because I had a lot of my staff wanting to go different places. And I said, let's focus on that now. And I said, but we can't be Prairie Dog. And I'd asked one of my staff uh, folks, my PR guy I said, look up uh, nicknames for Prairie Dogs. And he said, uh, you know, a, a, a nickname for a Prairie Dog, a couple of them I really liked was Whistle Pig. A whistle pig is a nickname for a prairie dog. Whistle pigs be a pretty cool name, but it was too close to the iron pigs. Right. Uh, it truly really was not authentic to the Texas region because that was a northern prairie dog. So that one was out. And a couple other names. And all of a sudden he goes, and he's reading, he goes, the early, and he had to read, go find a story within a story 
to find this name. And he said, the early pioneers called the prairie dog a sod poodle. And I, it just, I just caught at that moment. And I looked up at Jason from Brandios uh, and, and I said, did you just feel that? And he goes, yeah. And my staff's all looking at me and I said, did you guys feel that? And they all said, yeah. I mean, so we knew right then we had something special. I mean, it just like smacked you in the face, but that is awesome. we had to go through the process. So sod poodles became the category listing for the prairie dog. The name prairie, uh, sod poodle was not submitted, but we had to take a, a, a turn because that name was the number of one category submitted. More people, in other words, sent in the name prairie dog than any other name. And then, uh, and then, so we had to pivot to find sod poodles, but that became the category for that. Then you had long haulers for the travel industry, uh, the jerky for the beef industry, uh, boot scooters for the Western, and uh, bronco bronc busters for the for the uh, uh, quarter horse industry. And so we all those were our five names, and we put them out there. And the sod poodles, even though it started out, I mean, literally people hated it. 20, 20 percent of people thought, "Hey, this could be pretty cool." 80% of people said, I hate it. We need to get rid of this president and this GM because <laughs> he doesn't know what he's doing. Oh. And so all of a sudden it started to switch to where you go down to our, our big thing down here is our, our local street markets. And you see people making, so this was before the vote had happened. The name's out there, but the vote uh, hadn't occurred yet. You're starting to see cookies made with sod poodles on it. And people creating their own logos and everything else because wow. at this point we hadn't named the team or launched it we just put it out there as a five finalist you had people making signs t-shirts of their own uh, i remember a, a, a lawyer did a, a tv commercial that said you know is one of these long arm of the law guys right and he said if you have an accident and you're involved in this you don't need a sod poodle you need this uh long arm expert in the law uh there was a a uh, a, mit, a uh, sermon that was done at a large non-denominational church here in uh, in Amarillo that was called Sod Poodles and Mind Boggles. Chick, the uh, local Chick-fil-A signs were saying uh, Sod uh, Chick Chick-fil-A tastes better than or chicken tastes better than Sod Poodles. So <laughs> every time one of these things happened, we pushed it it's because right. it's like this interaction, this engagement is incredible. So we really pushed that and all of a sudden, next thing you know that the 80-20 starts to shift and by the time we released the brand uh, to getting to that March, uh, which was a total of about five months, it had become the most hated name to the number one brand in all of baseball, voted on on a national MLB Fox poll. So uh, a incredible turnaround and, and there was so many things. That was probably the most difficult part because it was a long journey in the, in, Literally, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people did not want me to uh, be here or the team to be here after we announced those names as, as finalists. But, you know, people turn, they started to warm with it. And the whole point of sod poodles, as you know, in minor league baseball is to make you smile. You can't yeah. say the word sod poodle without smiling. Right. It's yeah. just impossible. Yeah. And so the baseball is going to take care of itself. And that's what we told people. We got very serious, young, great athletes in the, in the San Diego Padres, there's a, their careers are very serious. That outcome of that game is very serious. How we conduct our business is very serious. But when people come to the ballpark, they want to have a great time. They want to check their stresses and worries of the day at the gate and come in and just come into the sod poodle world. It's a sod poodle world when you come out here to Amarillo. And, and our fans really love it and they take off to it. And like I say, it's, it's been very successful for us because people have learned to have fun and, and to laugh at themselves. You have to laugh at yourself or you're, or you're going to be a very sad person. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it makes sense now. I always wondered how the name came about and what it meant. And I think that's well thought out. Very well thought. That might be the most well thought out <laughs> name. You guys did your, your homework. So that was good. One last thing. So first year, I see you got some hardware too on your hand. You guys had a pretty good season on the field as well, right? So... Yep, uh, for your views, that's our uh, National League, uh, not National League, our Texas League championship ring. So very fortunate. And, and again, I, I attribute every, all the successes we have this year to our fans. 
I mean, I can put the best ideas, best promotion. My staff and I can collectively do the do all these promotional ideas and put the ballpark together and and you know uh, put the team out there. But unless the community responds, it doesn't really mean anything. So yeah. we we literally in that first year there was so many accolades. And I again I credit to the community. We were the baseball America minor league baseball team of the year. So out of all 160 minor league teams. Uh, we won the organization of the year uh, in the Texas League, our, our manager of the year. We won the best construction under under uh, 50,000 people or over 50,000 people in any market in Texas. We we had the best AA ballpark in the in the country, Ballpark Digest. Um, uh, the, 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 literally, the accolades go on and on and on. Really, Amarillo took the baseball world by storm, and it's because of how they reacted, how they. The, the passion that they showed towards this community and this, these players. But uh, we won the, and I say that without fail, that this community willed this team to win. There were numerous games where we were down five, six, seven runs going into the seventh and eighth inning. And most ballparks, you know, you go, and it's, it's pretty much a ghost town at that point. Mm -hmm. There were still 5,000 people here screaming for the players. And the players up there going, you know, they're just human beings. They're not, they, they, yeah. their natural instincts take over. Like, okay. I yeah, guess go. Gonna, yeah. I guess I'm not going to lay down. We got a chance to win this thing. At least they think we do. So why right. won't I think that? And so they just kept working. And those players never quit, and the fans never quit. And so uh, we we squeaked in there at the end of the first half, uh, won the, the first half title by a half game. And then we got to the championship uh, round, and and we we fell behind the first two games against Midland. We had to win three in a row. Uh, uh, three uh, um, three disqualifying games. So if you lose one, you're out. So it's best of five. We we're already down 0-2. So you lose one and you're gone. And then, so we won all three in a row uh, against Medlin to go to the finals against Tulsa. And then uh, just incredible. We're, we're, we're up one. Uh, up. By the time we get to Tulsa, we're down 2-1. Uh, we, we face, again, two more elimination games uh, and win them both. The last one culminating on a grand slam in the top of the ninth inning uh, by Taylor Trammell to give us a, a, I think it was a three, two or three run lead at the time. And we're down three, one, and then uh, he has a bomb and it's the most historic bomb you've ever seen. I, I'm sure you've seen nice. video of it, but yeah. it was incredible. And I really feel like, I mean, we had more fans. Uh, we have many fans in, in, in Midland as Midland did and as many, at least by voice and crowd, our excitement level in Midland and not as many as Tulsa, but pretty darn close. And we were a lot louder in Tulsa than the Tulsa crowd was. That The fan base, again, they did not want this team to lose. We came back from both Midland and Tulsa. We had 350 people waiting at our gate at midnight to welcome the, the, the players home. Uh, oh, from that's the awesome. How far, is, how far are the cities apart? Uh, Midland is about three hours away. Tulsa okay. is about six and a half hours away by bus. Yeah, uh, not too bad. So it, it was uh, the fact that, you know, and they put this together while, while we're on the way back. You know, that's, a, that's a product of social media, able to communicate yeah. and, and put a crowd together. But that, ha that many people waiting to, to congratulate these guys after an incredible season. The players got off the bus and they were like awestruck. They yeah. didn't know oh, this doesn't happen. This is. <laughs> oh, well, there were balloons. There were signs that the fans had made put up over the front gate uh, and incredible, incredible. And so uh, I, we brought the trophy back with us and I got home a few minutes early. Uh, so uh, I, I, I let the fans come into the ballpark and take a picture with the trophy. And that was the first time they'd ever seen the Texas league trophy. And it was a really cool night. Very cool experience. I mean, what a, what a way to launch a team, you know, a new ballpark, new, new everything. And then it cap it off with a championship. That's, that's pretty cool. You got something special there for sure. So yeah, yeah, really I'll definitely, really uh, I'm going to try to try to get out there in the next uh, season, hopefully uh, check out a, check out a game. So I told my son, we were going to do a cross country trip here soon. So. Well, you gotta go, you gotta come through uh, Amarillo and you, you really need to experience it because it's, it, it I've had a lot of people from the industry come in and go, I just, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand yeah. it. I don't believe it, but it's, this is baseball. This is let's move Cooperstown right here to Amarillo because I'm telling you 
the, the way that people in Amarillo love baseball and the way they support this team, uh, I'm joking, of course. We'll, we'll leave <laughs> Cooperstown. Cooperstown. Don't want to get anyone mad at me. Uh-oh. Yeah. There's no, but I mean, I think a lot of people are – strong here. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people probably are looking at, well, how do we duplicate this somewhere else? I mean, because, I mean, you want to have that success. And, you know, I know up in Fredericksburg where I was up there, I mean, outside of the um, non-original name that they came up with, <laughs> you know, the, the Nationals, great. Um, you know, there's a lot of support there, but it's it's quite different from, you know, even even where you're at. And I know they're real happy up there, so. Well, I, um, I, I'll be honest with you, I think a lot of that, what helped to create Sod Foodles was our constant communication. We, we wanted the community to be a part of the journey. Yep. So they were with us the whole way. I mean, yeah. everything we did from every announcement, we made it a very public announcement. The, our communication to and from our, our fans has been top notch and I credit our staff for that. That's, we, we brought, we built this stadium, we created this organization, but we brought the community along in every step of that way. And I think that's what helped to create the, the aura that it surrounds this organization. And, uh, and I think we'll surround it for many, many, many years to come. Yeah. Well, Tony, I appreciate you joining me today. It was great talking. I could probably talk to you for another couple hours, um, but um, people you drop off after an hour. You know, my, my few listeners drop off after an hour. So I try to keep them in that realm. So I, I appreciate you though joining me. It's great chatting with you. Yes, no problem. Stay in touch and uh, and uh, we'll do this again sometime after our second Texas League title. <laughs> Perfect. 21. <laughs>